Everything rumbled around, the ground shook. Steel rained down on the fortress of Stalingrad, crushing people and animals, shattering shelters, vehicles, weapons and tearing telephone wires. Communication between the Army Command and headquarters was still maintained by a few radio transmitters that survived the bursts of shells, mines and volleys of rocket mortars. This was the Red Army's response to the refusal to capitulate. It began on January 10th, 1943. In the dugout of the Chief of Operations, the telephonist tried in vain to establish communication with the Yaki Army Corps. At the beginning of the barrage of fire from there transmitted information about the damage caused. Then the Corps fell silent, the connection was cut off. While we were anxiously waiting for the damage to be repaired, the artillery fire subsided, probably now went to attack the enemy tanks and infantry. Finally, the Beit Corps responded. From there, reported that an avalanche of Soviet tanks with infantry on armour broke through on our western and then southern sections of the front, the German defensive positions simply crushed. The soldiers fought desperately, but all was in vain. They were unable to hold back the onslaught, as they lacked not only anti-tank weapons, but even rifle ammunition. Despite the orders of the Chief of Staff, it was not possible to dig trenches and bunkers in the ground petrified by frost. Those who survived and could not escape were captured by the advancing Soviet troops. Tank wedges were hacking deeper and deeper into our front. And we had no reserves. Gradually the picture became clear. The main blow took the divisions of the May 8th Army and Fortifa Tank Corps. The blow of the Soviet troops aimed at the heart of the cauldron, at the airfield Pitomnik. The 44th, 76th Infantry and 29th Motorized Divisions are badly battered. It was not yet known what survived of them. All the time on the radio and telephone received new terrible news. The senior adjutant barely had time to correct operational maps. In the southwestern corner of the boiler also thickened clouds. Since the end of November 1942, there stood the 3rd Motorized Division. The settlements of Dmitrievka in the west, Rakotino and Sibenko in the south, were lost. The chief of operations was staring intently at the map. I looked questioningly at the colonel. Do you fear the encirclement of the 3rd Motorized Division, Elklep? Exactly. Until now, the division has repulsed all enemy attacks. Now, with the loss of Dmitrievka and Rakotino, both flanks are in danger. We should immediately withdraw the division from this projection to the southwest. Elklep immediately ordered to connect himself with the recently promoted to Lieutenant General Chief of Staff. Schmidt was already aware of the case, as well as Paulus, who was in his possession. The division was ordered to avoid encirclement to withdraw to new defensive positions east of the line Dmitrievka, Rakotino. On that fateful day of January 10th, liaison officers and bailiffs literally filled the army command post. It was hard to believe that these ragged figures were officers. Only their eyes, mouths and noses peeped out, and most of them had their legs wrapped in scraps of blankets. They were dressed in tattered, shabby overcoats. Only a few had winter uniforms, and these were mostly of Russian origin. Often these officers could not unbuckle the buckle of a field bag with their stiffened hands to get a report. Only after one or two glasses of hot tea, they began to talk incoherently about the terrible events of the last hours, the desperate resistance of the German soldiers, the batteries destroyed by enemy fire and exploding ammunition stacks, the panic in the rear units and among the wounded. Those who could move, mad with fear, fled to Stalingrad. A lieutenant of one of the divisions in the southwestern section of the cauldron reported that during the last few days, two or three German communists were calling on loudspeakers to stop resistance and surrender to the Russians. This is not the first time we have heard such propaganda, he added. They won't catch me at it. Only now the communists have a German captain and two Oberleutnants, unless, of course, it's a hoax. Do all soldiers react to calls to surrender as you do? I asked. Soldiers listen to the broadcasts, but they do not believe what they say. The fear of capture was still so great that even in a hopeless situation, when every minute of delay could cost lives, 
Only a few soldiers went over to the side of the Red Army. Years of anti-Soviet propaganda paralysed most German soldiers and influenced their behaviour. It led to the deaths of tens of thousands of people in the Stalingrad cauldron alone. These people would have been saved if they had heeded the reasonable call and stopped resisting. Colonel General Paulus immediately reported to the command of Army Group Don about fraught with dire consequences of breakthroughs in the western and southern sections of the cauldron. He added that the command of the 6th Army does not see a serious opportunity to stop the enemy's advance. Despite this, hastily formed combined units were sent to the threatened areas. Although it was clear to Paulus and Schmidt that further weakening of the divisions fighting in the city was unacceptable, they themselves ordered LI Army Corps to transfer as many battalions, companies and artillery units as possible to the western and southern sections of the cauldron. The army mechanism creaked, but it still worked. It obeyed its own internal laws. Colonel General Paulus was aware of the mortal danger threatening his army. He suffered severely from the responsibility he had shouldered. But Paulus, as well as his inner circle, considered the culprits of the disaster only Hitler, the general staff and the command of Army Group Don. We continued to act, although our hearts were bleeding and the spirit was broken. Many paid for it with their lives. I will never forget a conversation with Paulus on the evening of January 10th, 1943. This conversation shows that we were then torn by internal conflict and shows that in the end we were all then in favour of continuing the war and believed that we should sacrifice the Sixth Army. My dear Adam, began the commander, now of course many soldiers and officers ask why Paulus did not accept the offer of surrender. Why he in this hopeless situation does not act contrary to Hitler's orders? You know that I have no right to act against the orders of the High Command. But that's not the only thing that prevents me from surrendering. How will the war end if our armies in the Caucasus are surrounded? And that's the danger they face. While we are fighting, we are constraining the Russian armies here, which they need for a major offensive operation against Army Group A in the Caucasus, and against the still unstable front from Voronezh to the Black Sea. We must hold here to the last so that the Eastern Front can stabilise. Only if this succeeds can we hope that the war will end well for Germany. Let me make one remark, Mr. Colonel General, I inserted. Probably if I were you I would hardly dare to surrender. But let's say that it happened. Could the Russians move their armies released here to a front more than 300 kilometres away from us sooner than in a few weeks? In this you are certainly mistaken. The Russians are masters of improvisation, they have proved this many times in the past. What seems impossible to us is possible to them. With our desperate position in the southern sector, any increase in enemy forces could be fatal to us. I could find myself responsible for the loss of the war as a whole. To prevent such a catastrophe, we must fight on. Neither Colonel General Paulus nor Colonel Adam thought at that time that the real misfortune was the outbreak of the war a war, which in its essence and from the very beginning was a political, economic and military crime, because it was directed against the historical development of events. Already the First World War showed that in the 20th century it is impossible to carry out a policy of conquest and plunder which in the 19th century was still practiced by some imperialist states. Even then, such a war was a challenge to other states, and they united against Germany, which was striving for world domination. The troublemaker was punished. Undoubtedly, the Second World War unleashed by Hitler's Germany was even more criminal. It was bound to end in defeat because the peoples, especially the peoples of the Soviet Union, showed an indomitable will to resist. We did not ask ourselves fundamental questions about the nature of the war, its historical significance and its moral and political objectives. We were far from understanding all these issues. Raised in a nationalistic and militaristic spirit, we were hardly capable of posing these questions. This was the real cause of our unhappiness, and we rolled further and further towards the abyss, for misguided as we were, we considered it our duty to hold on to the end. On January 10th, and in the days that followed, one terrible news followed another. They all spoke of the same thing. 
it was reported about a new breakthrough of the defensive line, fleeing from the Russian tanks. Our soldiers were abandoning their positions without orders. The incompetence of the commanders of combined units was revealed. Everywhere began to decompose. A particularly disturbing message came on January 12th. Our only airfield Potomac captured by Russian tanks. The soldiers fled in panic. The chief of staff was frantic. How could this have happened? According to the latest reports, we had the impression that the airfield was not yet in immediate danger. Maybe it was just a rumour? Schmidt demanded complete clarity, because it was about the safety of the Army Command post. The reconnaissance team sent there soon returned. It turned out that our troops, pilots, chauffeurs, orderlies, wounded escaped from the enemy reconnaissance, meanwhile again moved back. This time I could understand the fit of rage at Schmidt. Paulus ordered to strengthen the defence of the airfield and urgently resume its operation. A staff officer, who went to nursery to get the mail, told us in detail about the events at nursery. Panic began suddenly and developed into unimaginable chaos. Someone shouted the Russians are coming in the blink of an eye, the healthy, the sick and the wounded all jumped out of tents and dugouts. Everyone tried to get out as soon as possible. Some were trampled in panic. The wounded clung to their comrades, leaned on sticks or rifles and waddled in the icy wind towards Stalingrad. Exhausted on the way, they immediately fell down, and no one paid any attention to them. In a few hours they were corpses. A fierce struggle ensued over seats on the vehicles. Ground staff of the airfield, medics and lightly wounded first rushed to the surviving cars on the edge of the airfield Pitomnik, started the engines and rushed to the highway leading to the city. Soon whole clusters of people were hanging from fenders, running boards, and even radiators. Cars nearly collapsed under the weight. Some stopped for lack of fuel or engine failure. They were overtaken without stopping. Those who were still able to move were fleeing, the rest were crying out for help. But it didn't last long. The frost did its work, and the cries subsided. There was only one motto, run for your lives. But how could one save oneself in a broken city, in which we were constantly attacked by the Russians? It was not a question of salvation, but of self-deception of fear-driven, ragged, half-dead people, broken physically and morally in the battle of annihilation. Soon, however, it became known that the nursery was back in our hands, and although it turned out that the airfield was attacked only by enemy reconnaissance, few of the sick and wounded went back. Too deeply seized fear of our soldiers. Most of the pilots and orderlies only by evening returned to the nursery. In the army headquarters, and especially in the Lee Army Corp headquarters, there were various plans whether it is impossible to reduce the territory of the cauldron and thus concentrate forces to create a known reserve. Paulus rejected this plan, explaining that it would mean the voluntary surrender of a vital airfield. Is it impossible to stop the resistance after all? Others questioned. No, not that. It would be tantamount to capture and would endanger our armies fighting outside the cauldron, said Paulus. Maybe it would be better to break out of the cauldron in small groups without artillery preparation. This proposal came from the headquarters of Seedlitz. The meaning of the proposal was as follows divisions located on the bank of the Volga River at night will try to break through the frozen river to the south behind the enemy lines. There they would join the German troops fighting between the Don and the Volga, and also moving south. Ziedlitz's plan called for the 6th Army to link up with German troops outside the cauldron. We assumed that the retreating army of Gotha is still fighting south of Timlianskaya. Schmidt believed that such a breakthrough operation would cost the 6th Army dearly. Nevertheless, he agreed with her. It seemed very strange. Until now, Schmidt stubbornly demanded unconditional obedience to Hitler's orders. Now that the breakthrough is hopeless, he is going to disobey orders. However, even this plan was not realised. True, it was approved by some divisions, whose soldiers had already been in the city for many weeks and physically were not yet completely exhausted. All other divisions rejected the plan as illusory. 
because they did not consider it possible to conduct an offensive by the forces of half-starved sick soldiers. All this showed once again that the army command was wandering in the dark, and in the higher headquarters reigned complete confusion. None of us knew where the German troops in the southern section of the Soviet German front. The head of the intelligence department of the army headquarters claimed that they had withdrawn 400 kilometers to the west, but we did not believe him. This would mean that the German army had rolled back to the original positions of the summer of 1942. But then all our last year's struggle was in vain. We did not want to believe it, for we concluded with caustic irony Morgenstanovsko go Palmstrom cannot be what should not be. Manstein, who knew well the mood in the Sixth Army, tried to keep Paulus in the dark about the situation on the fronts. Although the Sixth Army was deeply disappointed in Manstein, who in the difficult days abandoned it to its fate, Paulus and Schmidt, in this desperate situation, made another attempt to induce him to some action. They authorized the commander of the 9th Anti-Aircraft Division, Major General Pickett, to fly to the headquarters of the Army Group Don and report in detail to Field Marshal von Manstein about the disastrous situation of the encircled army. In the last days, even fewer transport planes arrived to us than usual. Hunger reigned in the cauldron. Pickett had to achieve at last from Manstein improved supply by air to alleviate at least a little bit of the plight of the 6th Army. In fact, this move by the Army Command was as much self-defeating as some of its earlier actions. But it had another, unexpected consequence General Pickett did not return to the cauldron. Before departure, he assured his Chief of Operations, and introducing himself on the occasion of departure, and Colonel General Paulus, that he would fly back immediately upon completion of the task. However, we waited for him in vain. Soon we received a radiogram from Pickett last night circled over Pitomnik. The attempt to land failed, forced to return. That same night other airplanes landed at Pitomnik. We were outraged. However, nothing was taken against Mr. Pickett at that time. I sat in my dugout and thumbed through the papers that Oberfeld Fable Kupper had brought me. Among them were enemy leaflets. I carelessly pushed them aside. My thoughts hovered between Germany and the front. If my family back home knew what was happening here, in the steppe between the Volga and the Don, if they could see these sunken, starved faces, blackened by mud and frost, but the operational reports of the general command still sounded reassuring. Not one word about the horrors of this battle of annihilation. For weeks now I have not seen a newspaper, nor have I heard from my wife and daughter. How worried they are about me. What will happen to them when they receive the terrible news of our destruction? Automatically I reached out my hand for the leaflets. At first I thumbed through them almost machine-like, then I began to read. The names of the signatories Walter Olbricht, Eric Weinert and Willie Bredel were unfamiliar to me. I only knew that they were communist emigrants. This did not serve as a good reference for me at the time, but what they wrote was not without meaning. Their language was simple and persuasive, and they were surprisingly well informed about our situation. They knew that we dreaded captivity and that we believed Hitler's promises to rescue us from the cauldron. All the leaflets pointed out that Hitler and the high command of the ground forces were lying and deceiving us, promising to rescue us from the deadly grip of encirclement, they had no further opportunity to do so. The Wehrmacht high command is speculating that we are unable to get a correct picture of the general military situation. One of the leaflets contained precise data on the losses in material we suffered in the last battles. In others it was said that Hitler had betrayed the German people that it was pointless to die and that further resistance was hopeless. One place said something like this here, we have German prisoners of war. Stop the resistance immediately. It's the only way to save your life. I went through the leaflets. Thinking soberly, I had to admit that sometimes I came to the same conclusions myself. The last promises of Hitler, of the army high command and of Manstein, were they not empty? Nothing, resolutely nothing, has been fulfilled of what we were promised in bombastic terms. 
Yet can we trust these Germans who address us from the enemy camp? Are they not communists who have betrayed their fatherland? Of course, from the military point of view, they are right my experience. My reason told me so. But as a soldier and officer, I rejected this propaganda because it undermined the morale of the German troops. My attention was drawn to another leaflet. Paulus argued that the meaning of our continued resistance is to enable Army Group A in the Caucasus to avoid the threatened encirclement. In the leaflet, however, said that this group of armies is already in the area Rostov. Was not Paulus mislaid? Is not deliberately Manstein keeps in the dark the commander of the 6th Army? That would be too much. I did not see a way out of the labyrinth in which led me to read the leaflets. Finally, in one of the leaflets, I read the names of three officers who had allegedly been taken prisoner by the Soviets back in 1941, Captain Doctor. Haderman, Oberleutnant Harisius and Oberleutnant Raya. I was puzzled. Doctor. Haderman was obviously a reservist. I remembered the Hessian town of Schluchten. There, as a schoolboy, I had met a gymnasium student named Haderman. Later, he became a philologist. But the surname doesn't mean anything. As if these three officers addressed our soldiers at night through a powerful speaking machine. Thus confirmed what the lieutenant from the southern section of the boiler told me on January 10th. Damn it. Who should I believe? Cupper had better relieve me of these things. I called him. Why did you put these leaflets on my desk? I thought, Mr. Colonel, that they would interest you, he replied. You have read them too, Kappa. What is your opinion? You may speak frankly, I added, noticing Kappa's hesitation. Yes, Mr. Colonel, we have read the leaflets. According to the contacts, the order to hand over all found leaflets is only formally obeyed. Although hardly anyone has the courage to side with the Red Army, the opinion that the Russians do not shoot prisoners of war is gradually gaining ground. A liaison of the IV Army Corps said that last night a soldier of the 371st Infantry Division, whom many people know, addressed them through a loudspeaker from the Russian trenches. Do the soldiers of the headquarters talk among themselves about these leaflets, Kappa? There's a lot of controversy about the leaflets these days. Some are negative about them, others are thinking about what it says, and even defending the allegations. In any case, Almost no one believes that people are shot in captivity. Kappa left. I had nothing to do, in fact, and I sank into deep thought. Thoughtful or rather anxious was Paulus, who some time later called me to himself. Oberleutnant Zimmermann made it clear that apparently the Colonel General had a need to talk to me. When I entered, Paulus was sitting at the desk, head propped up, his right hand stroking his forehead. I already knew this habit of his. Almost always at this time his face twitched particularly hard. What's wrong, I thought. In front of Paulus lay some paper. Silently he held it out to me. It was a leaflet addressed directly to Paulus and signed by Walter Ulbricht, a deputy of the German Reichstag. I read it carefully word by word. Clear, logical arguments Ulbricht proved that Paulus obeying Hitler's orders is not acting in the interests of Germany and the German people, his duty to stop useless resistance. I looked questioningly at the army commander and returned the leaflet to him. Of course, said Paulus thoughtfully, the author of this message, if you look from his bell tower, right, he sees all events as a politician. As a civilian, he cannot understand what obedience means for a soldier, nor can he understand the considerations that guided my decision. Before you, Mr. Colonel General, called me in, I read similar leaflets by Ulbricht, Weinert and Bredel. Their language is not familiar to us. Everything in me is opposed to their views, but in many respects they are right. Let's put it this way. Adam, they see things in a different light than we do. I am in no way denying these people's good intentions. But to me this is undermining soldier discipline, and I can't accept that. What will we come to if... In time of war, soldiers oppose the government of their own country. I haven't quite figured it out myself, Mr. Colonel General. 
but I'm wondering more and more often what is the point of driving tens of thousands of people to their deaths? Is it worth sticking to the traditional notion of soldiers' duty when our trust in the high command has been betrayed more than once in a heinous way? Are there still serious grounds which, from a military point of view, would justify our deaths? I may assume, Mr. Colonel General, that you are familiar with the contents of all the leaflets. One of them says that the Caucasian Army Group is fighting already in the Rostov area. In that case, the danger of encirclement has passed. Then why these terrible human sacrifices of the Sixth Army? I've read these leaflets, but I can't believe these statements. We must be as critical as possible of all propaganda. What if it is true? If we have been deliberately or unconsciously misled by our high command, I cannot fully accept your arguments. Manstein knows from Pickett how desperate our situation is. I simply cannot imagine that he is not moved by the suffering and loss of life of our army and that we are being asked to sacrifice in vain. We are ordered to defend ourselves here, and out of a sense of responsibility to Army Group A in the Caucasus, I cannot act otherwise. So this conversation ended in nothing. We pondered and debated. However, we forced ourselves to tread in an enchanted circle. We were not capable of setting aside senseless and even criminal orders and rising to true responsibility towards our people. And so even the agitated appeals of the German anti-fascists did not help us at that time. Lieutenant General Schmidt summoned me to his office. Reconnoiter the new command post, Adam. We are going to use the command post of the 71st Infantry Division, which moves into the city south of the Taritza River. As far as I know, we will be able to accommodate in shelters located in the gully near the village of Stalingradsky. Take care of their distribution immediately. The adjutant of the 71st Infantry Division will be waiting for you at the Stalingrad Highway, where the road to the gully leaves. Returning to my dugout, I arranged by telephone with the head of the rear of the division about when I would arrive at his place. On January 13th at 9 o'clock my car was standing ready to leave. It was only a few hundred metres to the highway. The line of wounded kept moving towards the city. Already after a kilometre my passenger car was overcrowded with them. Two of the wounded were even standing on the footrests. Drive slower, I ordered the driver, who feared for the integrity of the axles and springs. I decided to make a small detour to Stalingrad and take the wounded to the infirmary there, although the car was already heavily overloaded. Immediately after Gomrak, we took another one. I saw him from afar, he was standing there, begging with his hands wrapped in rags. As we slowly drove closer, I saw a look of despair on the child's face. Tears were streaming down his cheeks. I remembered my son and told him to stop. The unfortunate man waddled over to the car. Please take me to Stalingrad, he begged. We squeezed in, and the wounded man sat on the front seat. The young man was not yet nineteen years old. He had been sitting on the road for hours with frostbitten hands and feet, and no one took pity on him. He did not know how to thank me and kept trying to shake my hand. It seemed to him that in Stalingrad he would find salvation. I dropped off the wounded at the infirmary in the western part of the city, having put in a word for them to the doctor on duty. We almost had to carry the young man in our arms. He wanted to give me a piece of dry sausage as a farewell gift. My mother sent it, I kept the sausage, he said sincerely. Of course I refused the gift, saying that he needed it more than I did. On the sides of the highway lay many corpses, so ended their journey wounded and sick. They lay down for a moment to gain strength, fell asleep from fatigue and froze. The dead also lay on the road. No one cared to commit them to the ground. Tanks and cars drove over the frozen corpses and flattened them. Drivers and pedestrians stumbled over them and stumbled senselessly and stupidly onward. This highway was nicknamed the Road of Death. Hundreds of all kinds of wreck trucks, cars and special vehicles, smashed and overturned by air bombs, with their cargo and mangled corpses of people. Every now and then there were mangled tanks and guns, sometimes a burned-out airplane and, 
and finally countless quite serviceable vehicles that lacked only fuel. My all-terrain vehicle stopped. In it sat waiting for me adjutant of the 71st Infantry Division. After all I had seen, I didn't want to talk. We turned into a deep gully, along the bottom of which between the steep slopes passed the road. Here was built a real settlement of bunkers. It was called Hartmannstadt after the name of the division commander, Lieutenant General von Hartmann. The dugouts were arranged along the steep left slope in three stories connected by staircases. The staircases and passages were railed. A kitchen and pantry were also dug into the slope. During the Western Campaign, the 71st Infantry Division took the northern forts of Verdun, Volk and Duarmont. It was nicknamed the Lucky One its vehicles bore a clover leaf as an identifying mark. Now, however, luck had irrevocably left the division. I found Lieutenant General von Hartmann in a very depressed mood. In what a terrible position we are in, he said to me, I see no way out. Of my division, which I have always been so proud of, almost nothing is left. I will not bear it. I, too, was extremely depressed and told him about my terrible trip on the road of death. You're right. Those horrible pictures can make anyone lose his mind. From further conversation I learned that the general had also lost his only son in the war. Fallen for the fatherland hitherto we had believed it, or at least we had been persuaded of it. After the bitter experiences of the last few months this interpretation began to seem to us extremely doubtful. But it was even harder to admit that our sons had died in vain. When I said goodbye, I had the feeling that von Hartmann was tormented by doubts even more than me, and he finally lost his composure. Then the rear chief and adjutant showed me well-equipped dugouts. In each stood a bricked-up stove. There were enough beds, tables and chairs. There were curtains and blackout devices hanging from the windows. All the rooms were lighted by electricity. How primitive in comparison to this was our old command post. The division headquarters was going to leave the next day. Consequently, the quartier team had to take over all the quarters immediately. I distributed the individual dugouts among the units of our headquarters and went to the army command post. Having informed Schmidt of the results of my reconnaissance trip, I asked him when we would move the command post. It depends on the changing situation and on when the switchboard will be installed. As long as the kennel is in our hands, we will stay here, he replied. I then informed Paulus about Hartmannstadt, and also about the terrible pictures I saw on the way. It is really terrible, he said. If I were sure that Army Grouper was safe, I would put an end to it. Since it remains unconfirmed, we must fight while we can. Can our troops still fight, Colonel General? After all, the western section of the cauldron was breached at the first blow. We've patched it up. The nursery is still in our hands. And who would willingly take prisoners? The soldiers still hope for salvation and want nothing to do with surrender. This strengthens me in my actions. Indeed, most of the soldiers were ruled by fear and hope. In the army headquarters, perhaps no one thought more about liberation. But no one had the guts to tell the troops the truth. It was not difficult to foresee that we could not hold the nursery for long. Therefore, Schmidt ordered to take out by airplane logs of combat operations of our headquarters, intelligence, operational rear, personnel Nuxastava, chief of engineering and chief of communications, so that they do not fall into enemy hands. This was entrusted to the senior adjutant of the headquarters control group, Captain Beru, a young officer, awarded the Knight's Cross. First, he was to once again outline to Field Marshal von Manstein the agony of the Sixth Army, and then fly on to report to the General Command of Land Forces and Hitler personally how ignominiously perish, dying of starvation, the Sixth Army. The Army Command assumed that Hitler may be more impressed by a decorated officer than a general. Beer never returned to the cauldron again. I now know that this was prevented on purpose, so that the hopeless situation of the Sixth Army remained unknown to her. Personally, knowing the captain, 
I have no doubt that he did not hesitate to speak bluntly in Manstein and Hitler, but the number of transport planes did not increase. The army continued to thaw. Field kitchens were increasingly left cold, because there was nothing to cook. Every now and then an already meagre dinner was cancelled. The front moved closer to the nursery. Red Army fighters circled over the airfield and shot down many of our Junkers 52 and Heinkel 111, approaching without cover. Those that managed to land were destroyed on the ground by Soviet bombers or low-flying sewing machines. It did not help that Schmidt radiated to the seconded Captain Topka if even now the number of planes will not be increased, raise a scandal. On the morning of January 14th, a team of quartermasters from Army Headquarters took over the command post of the 71st Infantry Division. The next day the kennel was lost definitively. The ground staff barely managed to withdraw to the reserve airfield, Gumrak, which had been hastily prepared over the previous two days. The commander of the VII Army Corps, Colonel General Goetz, also had to hastily abandon his command post on the edge of the Pitomnik airfield. He appeared with his headquarters at our location near Gumrak. The headquarters of the XIV tank corps, still located between Pitomnik and Novo Alexievsky, also withdrew to the area of Gumrak. During these days, Colonels Latman and Doctor. Corfis were promoted to major generals. Latman, whose armoured division was completely destroyed, was given command of the 389th Infantry Division, after its former commander, Major General Magnus was in this situation completely unfit for his position. Perhaps Magnus thought that Schmidt would let him fly away. But this calculation turned out to be wrong. By mid-January the cauldron had narrowed considerably. The new front to the south and west ran along the county railroad. It was occupied by the battered remnants of the 44th, 76th, 297th and 376th Infantry, 3rd and 29th Motorized Divisions, 14th Panzer Division, and the so-called Fortress Battalions. Now the Army Command post at Gumrak was under immediate threat. We had to fear that the new defensive line would not hold for long. In addition, the dugouts occupied by us were claimed by the headquarters and troops who fought. Therefore, on January 16th in the morning the Army headquarters moved to Hartmannstadt. Again, documents and war material were burned. To the new command post was taken only the most essentials. We drove along the highway in the few surviving vehicles, in small groups, past a string of starving, sick and wounded soldiers dragged to the city, looking like ghosts. At the station in Gumrak we got into a dense crowd of wounded. Driven by fear, they left the infirmary at the airfield and also rushed to the east. Only the seriously wounded and hopelessly ill remained, whose evacuation was impossible because of the lack of transportation means. There was no hope to cure them anyway. Paulus ordered the chief doctors to leave the infirmaries to the advancing enemy. The Russians also found a stack of stiffened corpses of German soldiers, which a few weeks ago had been piled behind this death house one on top of the other like logs. The orderlies did not have the strength to dig holes for the dead in the hardened, steel-like earth. Nor did they have the ammunition to blow up the earth and bury the dead in it. The Gomrak airfield could not replace the nursery in the slightest degree. It was under artillery fire, its runway was mangled by shells and aerial bombs. Heavy transport vehicles could land only at the greatest risk. At first the Luftwaffe command refused to send airplanes there at all because in recent days from Russian anti-aircraft artillery, fighters and bombing, as well as due to landing accidents, the German aviation lost dozens of aircraft. After the loss of the nursery passed two days, passing in the third, but not a single plane landed, although on our part everything was done to put in order the airfield Gumrak, and the headquarters of Army Group Don received a report about it. Apparently he failed to get the Luftwaffe command to send planes to Gumrak. Paulus addressed with a radiogram directly to Hitler my Führer, your orders to supply the army is not obeyed. Aerodrome Gumrak since January 15th is suitable for landing. The ground is flawless for landing at night. Ground organization is available, urgent intervention is necessary. 
the greatest danger is threatening N. At an operational meeting called by the Army Commander Schmidt scolded the Luftwaffe command, Oberkevartarmeister was in despair. It was to him that the demands of the starving units converged, merging into a grarem cry of horror do not let us die in such a miserable way. Bread. The Colonel General decided to appeal to Manstein once more. Two hours after sending a radiogram to Hitler, a radiogram was sent to the commander of Army Group Don. The objections of the Luftwaffe are considered a pretext by aviation specialists, namely the airfield service, the landing is recognized as possible. The landing strip has been considerably extended. The airfield service and its equipment, as before in the nursery, operate here flawlessly. The commander requested the intervention of the Führer directly, because the constant delay on the part of the Luftwaffe has already cost the lives of many soldiers. The Army Command believed that it had thus done everything possible to cope with the terrible disaster. No response came. Transport planes did not come. Paulus again radiated to Army Group Don still no aircraft. The Army asks to give the order to fly out. All was in vain. No response came neither from Hitler nor from Manstein, but more and more insistent and loud were the demands of the troops to the army command the number of losses from hunger is growing by the hour. At least minimum food rations are urgently required. There are cases of suicide due to hopelessness and despair. The army commander made another attempt to alleviate the plight of the soldiers. He demanded from Manstein that a Luftwaffe general be sent with whom it would be possible on the spot to discuss the possibility of landing planes in the cauldron. Is there a general who values his life so little? I asked myself the question when I heard about this attempt. My scepticism proved justified. On the morning of January 16th, instead of the requested general, an aviation major appeared at our command post. This was a clear indicator of how the 6th Army was quoted by the higher-ups. I was enraged at this new evidence of treason by the higher command authorities against the most elementary principles of soldierly decency. Captain von Seidlitz, a distant relative of the Lee Corps commander, entered my dugout. As a candidate for the Academy of the General Staff, he was sent to the headquarters of our army as an adjutant for military practice. On behalf of the Chief of Staff, he informed me that all specialists, including tank commanders, military technicians and candidates for the academy trainees should immediately fly out of the encirclement. The General Command of Land Forces ordered this, and Major von Zitziewicz, Hitler's liaison officer at our headquarters, reported Captain Seedlitz. Lieutenant General Schmidt asks you to call the officers concerned from the Army Corps and divisions, if possible, by telephone. We hope that some transport vehicles will finally arrive tonight. And what will happen to the seriously wounded? I asked. The head of the Army Sanitary Service informed me that they were taken to Gumrak. All the dugouts there are full. The Chief of the Sanitary Service has been instructed to immediately suspend the evacuation of the seriously wounded, answered Zeidlitz. I was numb. In every modern army, wounded in battle soldiers and officers are given preference in everything. Here, those who were of particular value for the continuation of the war were taken out of the encirclement, while the rest were condemned to death in cold blood. This could be considered as further proof that the High Command had already written off the Sixth Army. However, and the command of our army, apparently has changed its attitude to the question of departure from the cauldron. Until now, Schmidt unceremoniously rejected any request of this kind, why was it now that he did not object to the order of the general command of the land forces? For a moment I had a thought was not the chief of staff himself behind the new order. After all, the officers of the general staff are also specialists. True, they were not mentioned in the order. However, such an order could appear as the situation worsened. Such an assumption seemed so low to me that I tried to put it out of my mind. I turned to the captain. Allow me to congratulate you, my dear Zeidlitz. You must be one of the first to leave this ruinous trap. Have you packed your things yet? 
I don't think that's going to work, mister. Colonel, Schmidt told me this morning that after Captain Bear's departure, I'm indispensable here. Frankly, I don't understand that motivation. For days now, I've had nothing to do. From time to time, I'm sent to one of the divisions to familiarize myself with the situation. But it has long been known that the situation is equally dire everywhere, and decay is increasing. Yesterday, I was on the western edge of the Gumrak airfield. It is guarded by weak composite units. They have almost no anti tank weapons or artillery. And if there are weapons somewhere, there is no ammunition. Despite this, when the Russians advance, half dead soldiers resist. What is actually going on in their heads? I asked. This is a special question. Many are shrunken, sitting apathetically in their holes and barely answering when addressed. Others curse at the top of their voices, screaming that they have been cheated and betrayed. At the signal of the alarm, however, they immediately grab their rifles or automatic rifles and run to the machine guns or anti-tank guns. Probably the fear of capture is still stronger than the exasperation and frustration at the failures that haunt us here. That is certainly true for most, Mr. Colonel. However, in recent days, in a number of places, small fighting groups have capitulated with their officers. Eight weeks ago, this was almost unthinkable. The effect of enemy propaganda is taking its toll. Captain von Seedlitz bowed out. When I, standing in the door of the bunker, said goodbye to him, I saw down in the gully an air major accompanied by Elhep. An automobile came out of the shelter. The major got into it, and having trumpeted, left in the direction of the airfield Gumrak. This visit was not long. I wonder what will come of it, I said. I would also like to know, Mr. Colonel, replied Sadlitz and headed for the bunker of the chief of staff. Colonel Elhep came in to see me. Hair pilot only apologized. Schmidt attacked him with swear words and sharply said that his arguments do not interest us. The Sixth Army is waiting for food, ammunition, medicine and fuel. It is outrageous that we were left to our fate. Paulus was agitated, joined the opinion of the Chief of Staff, and said that the Luftwaffe did not fulfil their promise. The behaviour of higher authorities in relation to the Sixth Army is treachery, which cannot be justified in any way. So this major received a beating intended for the generals, I said. Let's assume that he will give it all verbatim. Do you think, Elklep, that this will improve our supply? Do you hear the shells bursting? The front is getting damn close to our command centre. How many more days can we hold out? We're deluding ourselves. A sober assessment of the situation would be to surrender. Then at least thousands of soldiers would have been saved. Further resistance is pointless. The Army General Command has written us off. A few more specialists will fly out. The rest of us can rot. I've had enough of this, Adam. But an officer can't capitulate to the Bolsheviks. He fights to the last bullet and then dies. Those are big words, Elklep. To continue useless resistance is irresponsible and even immoral. In this sense, I will continue to try to influence Colonel General Paulus. No one can forbid you to do so, Elep answered me. But you will achieve nothing. For Paulus obedience the highest military law. In the following days, I arrived to me specialists, mainly from tank and motorized divisions. They all glowed with joy. As a result of the protests of the Army Command, several airplanes with food and ammunition landed again at night. They were taking specialists to Army Group Don. I sincerely rejoiced at the flight out of the cauldron of Colonel Zell. Back in October 1942, our doctor advised him to urgently undergo a course of sanatorium treatment. Permission had already been given, as suddenly began a major counter-offensive of the Red Army. Zell immediately stated at that time that he could not leave the troops. At the beginning of December at Shearer he took a battle group, and later received from Schmidt a useless order to return to the boiler. Although his health was poor and he could hardly keep on his feet, he never once tried to fly away from the cauldron. A few days ago I asked him to take a picture of me. 
I wanted to send the film and camera to my wife and daughter with the next liaison officer. Then we had a frank conversation. Zell, an old member of the Nazi party, awarded a gold badge, told me that more than once advised Paulus to act contrary to Hitler's orders and do as his conscience tells him, responsibility for the army. However, in military matters, Paulus adheres to the point of view of Schmidt. He, Zell, considers it fatal. Colonel General, together with his chief of staff, are thus responsible for the senseless death of the Sixth Army. Then, in a fit of rage against Hitler and Goering, the Colonel of Engineers tore off his gold party badge from his tunic, threw it on the frozen snow, and stomped on it. Although this scene, in fact, was only a gesture without any further consequences, it still made an impression on me because it was an expression of strong protest, while Paulus, Schmidt, Elklep and others demanded unconditional obedience to immoral orders. It is possible that our chief of staff would not have put Zell on the list of departures from the cauldron if he had learned of our conversation. Schmidt, however, informed me on January 22nd that Zell would be leaving the boiler. I wanted to be the first to tell my friend this glad tidings. My call was answered by Zell's lieutenant. Is Colonel Zell at home? I asked, connecting with Mr. Colonel, what's new, Adam? Today or tomorrow you will fly out of the boiler as a liaison officer. There was silence on the other end of the wire. Apparently my friend was speechless with joyous surprise. Are you still on the phone, Zell? At last I heard his voice again. I hope this isn't an evil joke, he said. My dear Zell, in this case it would be inappropriate. I heard about it from Schmidt a few minutes ago. I heartily congratulate you and I am glad that someone who will not blabber about our heroic struggle will get out of here. I hope you'll tell only the truth back home. You can be sure of that, came the decisive reply. Don't forget to come and see me before you leave. At that moment, Captain von Seidlitz came in to see me. Excuse me, please, Mr. Colonel. Lieutenant General Schmidt asks you to identify an alternate landing site for our transport planes now. Gumrak is under heavy artillery fire. There was not a second to lose. With a few soldiers, I set off. Soon we marked with stakes a new site a few minutes' walk from our command post. In my dugout, Colonel Zell was waiting for me. He had already said goodbye to Paulus and Schmidt and told me about the conversation with them. I firmly remembered his words. Paulus's forces are really running out, said Zell. Saying goodbye to me, Paulus said, go with God and make your modest contribution to the fact that the command of the Wehrmacht again descended from heaven to earth. He expressed his thoughts very allegorically but in the mouth of Paulus it was still a destructive sentence, right? You can imagine how hard it was for me to talk to him. I looked once more into Paulus's eyes. With the words, may the grave cross of the Sixth Army not become a tombstone for all of Germany, I bade him farewell. In recent days Paulus indescribably suffers. He agonizingly ponders, looking for a way out, but cannot disobey the orders of Hitler and Manstein. And what is your impression of Schmidt? I asked Zell. I have not seen him for a few days, and was amazed at how he has changed. It is no longer the same old, convinced of victory, self-assured chief of staff. A man who had hitherto strictly condemned any negative speech, now sharply criticised the high command. In parting he said to me, tell everywhere you find it possible that the High Command betrayed and abandoned to the fate of the Sixth Army too bad he didn't realise this sooner, he could have spared the Sixth Army a lot of misfortune. For both Zell and me the farewell was not easy. We had endured hard days together and knew we could rely on each other. There was little hope that we would ever see each other again. As soon as the Colonel of Engineers left, the adjutant of the IVIV Army Corp reported by telephone that the Corp commander, General of Engineers Ioniki during an enemy air raid wounded in the head and shoulder. By duty, I immediately radioed this to the headquarters of Army Group Don. 
A few hours later from the personnel department of the ground forces followed the order to send the wounded general on the first car that will land in the cauldron. At this time the Russians had already occupied our last airfield, Gomrak. The planes were instructed to land in the village of Stalingradsky, although no landing strip had been traced there. From here General Ianeki, together with Colonel Zell, flew out of the encirclement on January 23rd. This was one of the last airplanes to depart from the cauldron. Most of the pilots, since they managed to break the enemy's anti-aircraft barrier at all, dropped food containers. If the containers fell by us, hungry soldiers would instantly pounce on them. Ignoring the order of the command, according to which all food containers were to be reported and handed over to a point created for this purpose, they mostly shared the food among themselves. Could they be blamed for this? For weeks they ate almost nothing. Brutal hunger drove them to the brink of frenzy and swept away all the precepts of discipline and decency they forgot, even about their helpless wounded comrades. January 23rd Corps commanders gathered at Paulus to review the situation. Instead of the wounded General Ineki commander of the IV Army Corps, was appointed commander of the 297th Infantry Division, Lieutenant General Peffer, made at the same time in the Generals of Artillery. Discuss the main question how to proceed. Generals von Seidlitz and Peffer advocated a cessation of hostilities, while Geitz, Strecker and Schlomer insisted on continued resistance. After this, Colonel General Paulus addressed the same question to Schmidt, Elep and myself. I pointed out that by continuing senseless resistance the army would perish, and suggested surrender. At this I looked at Schmidt. How would he react to that? I had already prepared for an explosion of rage. However, Schmidt remained calm he seemed to approve of my proposal. Only Ellep, as always, strongly objected. The commander showed indecision. As before, he could not step over his own shadow. He decided once again to report in detail by radio to the high command about the situation in the cauldron and ask for permission to surrender. In the evening of January 23rd, two Heinkel 111 landed at a temporary airfield, which was a few hundred metres away from us. Following this, Lieutenant General Schmidt invited me to his dugout. He recalled the content of the conversation we had in the afternoon at Paulus, and did not hide that he was very disappointed with the behaviour of the High Command. What does he want? I thought to myself. After all, all this is known to me as well as he, but Schmidt immediately clarified what he wanted. So far, he said, neither Hube nor other officers have not managed to improve our situation, although they all received the task to report personally to Hitler, or at least Manstein about the catastrophic situation of the army. I had the impression that none of them dared to tell the Fuhrer the plain truth. I should have flown myself to the headquarters for a report long ago. I was wary. Schmidt continued. The catastrophic situation forces us to take the last step to achieve finally freedom of action. I wanted to ask you to suggest to the commander to send me by airplane to the headquarters to report to Hitler. You can be sure that I will return to the cauldron without delay. I'm stunned. This evil spirit of the army, hitherto ordered to hold out to the last, threatened to bring to trial by court-martial anyone who talked about surrender, now intends to desert. There was no other way to regard his words, even with the reservations he had made. Any soldier at headquarters knew that probably the very next day no airplane would be able to land in the cauldron. I answered Schmidt succinctly. I recommend, Mr. General, personally report your urgent request to the commander. Angry but still restrained, he looked after me as I silently left his dugout. About this intermezzo I briefed the chief of operations, Colonel Elklep. In excitement he jumped up from his chair. What a despicable thing to do. You must tell the commander immediately. I'm going to him now and wanted to enlist your support. Paulus listened to my message with indignation, disappointed in his chief of staff, who always demanded to fight to the last bullet. Invite him to me. Now I know how to be with him. There was a knock on the door, and Schmidt entered. 
he probably expected to find Paulus alone and unprepared. He repeated to Paulus almost verbatim what he had said to me, trying to argue the necessity of his departure. The commander answered contrary to his usual immediately, and clearly and unambiguously. You stay here. You know as well as I do that the end may come at any moment. No one can help us. I think further conversation is unnecessary. Schmidt was silent. Paulus instructed him to compose a detailed characterization of the situation and draft a requirement to Hitler for permission to surrender. Schmidt silently withdrew. Pilots of both Heinkel received permission to take off. Detained earlier on Schmidt's orders, they waited for several hours in the bunker for errand boys. In just a few minutes their machines took off into the clear frosty night sky. Making another circle over our command post, they disappeared in a westerly direction. In my dugout Elklep was waiting for me. The question asked itself what to do when the end comes. You have said many times, Elklep, that you will never surrender. Soon, however, you will have to make a decision. My decision remains unchanged, Elep said. Senior officers do not surrender. If it comes to that, I will go to the front line and shoot until the penultimate bullet. I'll save the last bullet for myself. So you intend to commit suicide? Is that a soldier's honour? It's not the way. Paulus told me that some generals demanded that he issue an order forbidding generals and senior officers to surrender. Everyone must save the last bullet for himself. The commander dismissed this inordinate demand as a cowardly evasion of responsibility. He believes, and I supported him in this, that in our disastrous situation the officer remains with the troops and must share their fate. I do not deny that the officer must bravely hold out to the end. But afterward he has the right to use his weapons against himself, for he will no longer have anyone to command. It was evident that Elklep could not be dissuaded from his decision to commit suicide. I reminded him of his wife and children. I would like to see them. So I intend to initiate you into the plan, better said, the plans made by some of the officers. I guessed what the matter was. For some time now Elklep had been hinting at the intention of certain groups of officers to make their way westward. Until now I had not taken it seriously. But this night Elklep revealed his intentions in detail. It's time, Adam, to let you in on our plans. I believe it won't be more than a week before the cauldron is crushed. In the next few days, together with Lieutenant Colonel Niemeyer, Oberleutnant Zimmermann, Lieutenant Colonel Heitzmann of the 9th Anti-Aircraft Division, and another young anti-aircraft officer, we will reach the front line. There we will hide, wait for the advancing Russians to pass on, and then follow them southwest. The exact route has already been worked out. We have informed General Hube of our plan and asked him to drop food containers at certain points. I have marked the appropriate places on the map, which one of our liaison officers has already taken away from here. But that's nonsense, Elklep. Even if you manage to cross the front line here, you'll never reach your target. Think about it, the entire southern wing of our front is retreating and has already rolled back 400 kilometers to the west. You'll have to wade through enemy territory for weeks. It's a hopeless endeavor. We're well prepared. Backpacks full of wool and furs, bandages and medical supplies. We've saved a few days' worth of galettes and a few cans of canned goods, so we have something to eat for the first time. Have you also thought about the fact that this is desertion, Elklep, escape from responsibility? Your plan contradicts your own requirement to hold out to the last man. We do not want to desert, but to ask Paulus to relieve us of our posts, and we will realize our plan only if the commander agrees to it. By the way, Colonel Clausius, Chief of Staff Lai Army Corp., together with his adjutant wants to get out of the cauldron on skis. We expect to meet on the way. Separate groups from the 71st and 371st Infantry Divisions want to head south down the Volga to join the 1st Tank Army near the Tarek. No offence to me, but these are dangerous fantasies. You know that the 1st Tank Army is probably already in the Rostov area. 
Have you told this to your associates? And do you seriously think that the enemy will guard his rear so badly that he will not immediately capture such crazy fugitives as you? Be sensible, Elklep. Talking on this subject is useless. My decision is irrevocable. With these words, Elklep left my dugout. Early in the morning of January 24th, on the orders of Paulus Hitler was transmitted by radio report. Based on the reports of the Corp and personal reports of their commanders, with whom communication is still maintained, the army reports the situation. Troops without ammunition and food, there is contact only with parts of six divisions. The phenomena of decomposition in the southern, northern and western sections of the cauldron. The unified control of troops is no longer possible. In the eastern section of the small changes, 18,000 wounded without the slightest help with bandages and medicines, 44th, 76th, 100th, 305th, 305th, 389th infantry divisions destroyed. Due to the front is broken through in many places. Support points and shelters only in the area of the city. Further defense is pointless. Defeat is inevitable. To save the survivors, the army asks for immediate permission to surrender. The reply came immediately, and was brief. Hitler's radiogram said roughly the following. Surrender is ruled out. The Sixth Army is fulfilling its historic mission, fighting to the last bullet to make possible the creation of a new line of defence on the southern wing of the front. I openly stated to Paulus that I regarded this order as criminal, and that as a consequence it could not be considered binding. Lieutenant General Schmidt, who softened only temporarily and apparently not because of concern for the fate of the army, still demanded to hold to the last. He achieved his own. Paulus and now remained an obedient soldier and thus facilitated Hitler his criminal actions against the Sixth Army. About nine o'clock to us came shooting from rifles and machine guns, explosions of hand grenades. During the night the front had moved directly to the gully. All the staff men were at their dugouts. The drivers took their places in the cars. Would we still make it out of our location in one piece? The 71st Infantry Division had prepared for us a new command post in the south of Stalingrad in the cellars of a former hospital. Schmidt's harsh voice has already sounded. Prepare to move the command post. We quickly destroyed the remaining staff documents and all unnecessary personal property. I left myself two blankets, a briefcase with underwear and a carrier. We had to run. Bullets were already whistling over the beam. From the bursts of shells the window panes burst, and glass shards flew inside the dugouts. When eight days ago we took this command post, on behalf of the Chief of Staff, I made a reconnaissance of the defensive line in front of the gully. But who could fight on that line? a handful of soldiers from headquarters. The Russians themselves dictated to us what to do. Under cover of darkness, they moved to the command post at a distance of a few hundred metres. Our defensive line was already in their hands. Schmidt gave the order to the cars. Everyone hurriedly took their seats. Engines roared. We ran away from the gully. We were followed by hurrah, it was the Red Army attacked the ravine from the opposite side. A few more minutes of delay and the army headquarters would have been captured on January 24th. Looking back, I can say that it would have been only good for us, and for the whole army it would have brought the denouement closer and saved many lives. But fear ruled us at the time. The drivers drove as hard as they could when we reached the outskirts of Stalingrad, we had to slow down to pass between the ruins. We slowly moved forward, driving around bomb craters, mountains of rubble and stone, the remains of walls, stovepipes and concrete skeletons of buildings. What was not destroyed by shells was dismantled by German troops to equip positions, build dugouts and for fuel. On the bridge over the Taritza, an officer of the 71st Infantry Division was waiting for us. He led us to the basement where the headquarters was to be located. The preparation of the room was not a difficult matter after all. We had left almost all our possessions in the gully. Would this be our last main apartment? So we proudly called before the location of the army headquarters. 
Now in the stone hole, it sounded like a mockery. The only one who seemed indifferent to this was Lieutenant General Schmidt. He ordered me to organize a circular defense of our ruins. At the same time, it was necessary to designate a landing pad for the aircraft Faisal Storch. About this order, Paulus perplexed shrugged his shoulders. What nonsense. Where will come storm? But since Schmidt gave the order, carry it out, especially if it gives pleasure to the chief of staff. Elklep argued about Schmidt's new quirk, but took almost no interest in our affairs. I had the impression that Schmidt had not yet given up hope of getting out of the encirclement. Perhaps he contacted his friend General Hube by radio or forwarded him a letter with the pilots who left on the night of January 23rd to 24th. About a hundred metres from our basement was a level area that seemed suitable for landing a storm. Before evening, Lieutenant General Schmidt instructed me to mark it with signal lights, as he expected two planes to arrive during the night. Apparently, he reckoned that they would be brought in tow, for the storms themselves were unable to cover so great a distance. Was Schmidt really so naive and believed that the storm can land on our site, and Colonel General Paulus will allow him to fly away? To demand from the soldiers and officers of the army to fight to the last man, and to try to save his own life so behaved the officer, who bears a considerable share of the blame for the death of the Sixth Army. The morning came. The Chief of Staff's expectations were in vain. His attendant told me that all night Schmidt did not sleep a wink. Airplanes, it is true, flew over a very reduced in size cauldron. However, they were transport vehicles that randomly dropped containers of food. The pilots had already lost their bearings and could not determine where the German and where the Soviet troops. Fiesler Storch never arrived. My activity as adjutant of the Sixth Army came to an end. I was left with only a pencil and notebook, a seal, about a dozen knights' crosses, and as many German crosses. Sitting idle in the cellar was not to my liking. So I took over as liaison officer and went to the headquarters of the 71st Infantry Division, which was a few blocks south of our basement to begin with. The division command post was occasionally shelled by enemy artillery. The day before, Captain von Seidlitz, a candidate for the General Staff Academy, who had been seconded to the Army headquarters for training, had been killed by a direct hit here. Just as I arrived at General von Hartmann's house, several shells again exploded near the house where the headquarters was located. Among others, the personal adjutant of our Chief of Staff, Oberleutnant Schatz, was also killed. He had come with me in an all terrain vehicle and he was torn by a shell just at the minute when he was giving orders to the driver of the vehicle. Leaning over a map of Stalingrad, the general explained to me how his remaining forces were being used. Hartman's voice sounded calm and cold-blooded. I intend at the latest tomorrow to go to my infantrymen in the front line. In their ranks and among them I will meet death. Captivity is a dishonour to a general. I am of a different opinion, Mr. General. Many of our surviving soldiers will be taken prisoner. In this emergency, surrender and captivity are not dishonourable. We should have taken this step long ago. I believe it is our duty to share with the soldiers the bitterness of captivity. We should frankly say this to the troops, not set an example to them by suicide. Let me speak plainly in these last hours. And you, Mr. General, must set the record straight about your responsibility to our soldiers, and to your wife and your daughter, who are already mourning your son and your brother. It is not suicide that we must end, but the will to live in this hour. My words had no effect on the general. He said to me, I know you wish me well, Adam, but I will go my own way. And he bade me farewell. Colonel General Paulus was shocked when I told him about my conversation with Hartman. He ordered me to immediately connect with him by telephone. However, even he failed to change the division commander's mind. In the last hours I want to be with my soldiers, and I go to them so he replied to all entreaties Paulus, and Hartman left. Then I visited Colonel Roski, 
who with his headquarters was north of Tsaritsa in the basement of a department store. The upper floors of the building had been destroyed. However, there was plenty of space in the warehouses underground, so that the army headquarters could be comfortably housed here. Rosk agreed to prepare part of the basement for us. During the conversation with Rosky, I found out that he also wanted to avoid capture. For this purpose, he made a plan to get out of the encirclement. In the yard of a department store, he showed me a captured Soviet truck. Fully fueled and loaded with barrels of gasoline, it stood ready to leave. Rosk outlined his plan to me. In the division headquarters, there are three reliable heavy dedicated to my plan. As soon as the enemy penetrates here, we will mix with the troops intoxicated with victory and in the resulting confusion leave the courtyard on a truck. It will go completely unnoticed. Everyone will think we're carrying fuel. Once we're outside the city, we'll head west without stopping until we reach our own. Join us, Adam. We'll hide behind the barrels. Oh dear Rosky, you're crazy. Don't you think I can take your tales seriously? You won't even be able to leave the yard. Do you really think the enemy is stupid? And your soldiers who have believed in you and fought with you so far? Do you want to leave them to their fate? I can't believe that. Give up all this fantasy. My impulsive moralizing seemed to have made an impression on Roski. At first he looked at me with surprise, then he thought about it. Thank you for your words, he said to me. You are probably right. A commander should stay with his soldiers. I will again seriously consider my steps. Roski and I returned to the basement. I was sure that Paulus and Schmidt would agree to change our shelter. Therefore, we immediately outlined separate rooms for our headquarters. The way back to the army headquarters was under enemy artillery and mortar fire. The streets strewn with debris were almost deserted. All living things had taken refuge in cellars and ruins. Only somewhere waddled or crawled single wrapped figures, starving, frostbitten or wounded soldiers, looking for their unit or the infirmary, hidden in the basement. What has our proud Sixth Army become? And for what reason is it dying in such terrible conditions, here on the Volga, 2,000 kilometers away from the homeland? I was so deep in my thoughts that I didn't notice how I crossed the bridge over the Tsaritsa and turned off the main street. It turned out that we are already at our command post. Paulus and Schmidt agreed to move the army headquarters in the basement of the department store. Schmidt said that the move will be made depending on the change of situation. When I was alone with the Colonel General, he told me that he had Seidlitz again. He had detailed in Schmidt's presence that decay reigned everywhere in the troops. Seidlitz demanded an order to surrender, because there is a danger that otherwise the commanders will act at their own risk. Of course he is right, mister. Colonel General, I remarked. Everything happened as Seidlitz predicted in his memo of November 25th last year. It is time to put an end to this senseless resistance. To continue it is simply unacceptable. But Paulus blithely and this time, although between the order prohibiting surrender and the dictates of conscience lay a deep gulf. To follow the dictates of conscience he did not dare. Understand, Adam, that I cannot act otherwise, Paulus told me. I could not understand it now, but any talk about it would be superfluous. The inability of the army command to act independently caused in the troops disappointment, and some units tried to act themselves. Thus, one of the orders of the IV Army Corps said roughly the following given the large number of wounded, should not move the fighting deep into the city. It is necessary to hold the current front line of defence. Where further resistance makes no sense, it can be terminated, and the enemy can be made aware of this. Practically, this order opened the way to a partial surrender that is contrary to the point of view of the army command. Still, it did nothing against the order. Pure mockery of the dying army was a radiogram from the army personnel department, which said that with its receipt of the Iron Cross of the II degree is allowed to be awarded to company commanders, and I degree to battalion commanders. What company, what battalion had more commanders? 
and who at the gates of the kingdom of death needed these crosses? In the army headquarters it became known that in front of the front of the 297th, 371st and 71st infantry divisions in the southern part of the city appeared Soviet parliamentarians who offered to surrender in order to prevent further bloodshed. They guaranteed food for all surrendering units and medical care for the wounded. The commanders, disregarding Schmidt's order, negotiated with the parliamentarians but sent them back without resolving anything. Paulus and Schmidt took note of the message without saying a word. The 297th and 371st Infantry Divisions were subordinate to the IV Army Corps. I was curious whether they used the opportunity open to them by the Corps' order to lay down their arms. So far no details of this could be learned. Aleppi's group had finished its preparations. The Chief of Operations asked Paulus and Schmidt to relieve him and his comrades from duty. Consent was given. Soon, after warmly bidding farewell, the group set off. They wanted to try to hide from the advancing Red Army in the area of the 297th Infantry Division. Lieutenant Colonel von Belov, head of the Operations Department of the 71st Infantry Division, Lieutenant Colonel of the General Staff, was assigned to the Army Headquarters in Elkleps Place. In general, we were left with only 20 officers and soldiers instead of the previous 60. This handful continued to melt away. In a fit of despair, Colonel Elkleps' attendant, an elderly man and father of a family, committed suicide. He could not bear the fact that the Colonel had abandoned him to his fate. Upset, he sat silently among his comrades. No one paid any attention to the fact that he had left the basement room. Then a hand grenade explosion sounded upstairs. We found him dead in a pool of blood. From the units with which we still had contact came the same reports. The number of suicides was increasing. In some places there was a suicide epidemic threatening to break out. It was mainly young officers and soldiers who committed suicide. Late in the evening of January 25th, we received a report that the 297th Infantry Division surrendered with its commander, Major General von Drebber. The disintegration of the whole army had begun. On the morning of January 26th, I was sitting with Paulus at a small table in front of the basement window when a messenger came in and handed the commander a letter. The sender is Major General von Drebber read the commander with surprise. The letter was not opened at once. On the street, right against our window, an airplane bomb exploded. Glass shattered, shards of glass and metal flew over our heads, powder gases rushed into the room. The door flew out from the airwave. First of all, I thought of Paulus. When the smoke cleared, I saw blood on his head. However, nothing terrible had happened. The skin on my head was torn in several places. The paramedic who was called in applied light bandages. We were lucky once more. Finally, Paulus opened the letter. He delved into its contents with interest. It's almost unbelievable, said Paulus. Drebber writes that he and his soldiers were well received by the officers and soldiers of the Red Army. They are treated with correctness. It is as if we are all victims of false Goebbels propaganda. Drebber calls for an end to futile resistance and the surrender of the entire army. At that moment, Schmidt entered. When he learned what was happening, his face darkened. Never, he cried. Von Drebber would have written such a thing voluntarily he was forced into it. We are not capitulating. To be able to better influence the divisions, we will move into the department storeroom before noon today. Since the hope of the arrival of the storm on which he was going to escape had burst, Schmidt had become the same old Schmidt again. That same day the report came that General von Hartmann had been killed, standing at full height on a railroad embankment he was firing at the enemy with a rifle. A bullet hit him in the head, and he was killed dead. Colonel Roski was appointed commander of the 71st Infantry Division. Another heavy tidings overtook us on the same day, January 26th. General Stempel, commander of the 371st Infantry Division, 
committed suicide, reported his adjutant. The general's son, a lieutenant, who was on his own staff, studied in the Dresden gymnasium in the same class as my boy. The father said goodbye to his son, telling him that he had decided to shoot himself, as he could not endure the disgrace. Young Stemple, with a group of like-minded men, wanted to get down the Volga to Army Group A, but was captured. Thus eliminated all division commanders of the IV Army Corps. January 26th, Schmidt accidentally learned that Seedlitz gave regimental and battalion commanders the right to surrender at their discretion. Enraged, he demanded that Paulus remove Seedlitz from command and subordinate three of his divisions to Colonel General Geitz, commander of the VII Army Corps. Unfortunately, the commander, taken by surprise by Schmidt's demand, gave his consent to this. I was out of my mind that Paulus at such an hour decided to so severely punish the general, who in principle, from the beginning, from the beginning more correctly assessed the situation than the army command. Then Paulus realized that he was too hasty, but did not dare to take back the consent given to Schmidt. Colonel General was in an indescribable state. As a servant, he was completely helpless in the current situation and most importantly could not gather the strength to free himself from the influence of unscrupulous Schmidt. True, it seemed to me that he seemed to realize that he had been cowardly at the decisive moment. However, this realization depressed him even more and made him more passive. Paulus's physical and moral strength was running out. The staff of our army now consisted only of the commander, chief of staff, chief of operations, chief of army communications, first adjutant, and a few officers for errands. On January 26th, about noon, we left in two cars and one truck for our last main apartment. Rifles and machine guns were already firing in the streets near the ruined hospital. An officer of the 371st Infantry Division reported enemy tanks are approaching. The streets were busier than when I had driven through them the day before. The wounded and sick were being dragged to the Commandant's office in the central part of the city. According to army orders, that was their rallying point. However, this commandant's office no longer existed. In its place was an infirmary, packed with the wounded and sick. Those who could not fit in the building sought shelter in the nearby cellars, which were full to overflowing. When we took shelter in the department store, there was not a single cellar left in the whole part of the city occupied by us that was not packed to the limit. The chief of the sanitary service of the 71st Infantry Division reported to Paulus that only a small proportion of the wounded and sick were being treated. Most of the infirmary and hospital rooms had no lighting. At best the doctors and orderlies fiddling in some corner had a few more candles or trench lanterns. No one knew how many dozens or hundreds of people were lying on the bare floor, huddled closely together. If anyone did not move for a long time, his neighbour would shout, here's a dead man. It happened, however, that this went unnoticed, because those lying next to them also died. Without medicines, dressings and anaesthetics, doctors were almost powerless. Often all sanitary supplies were lost in the retreat, whether as a result of the vehicles becoming due to lack of fuel, or because they were bombed. In addition, the doctors and orderlies themselves were barely on their feet. However, they did everything that was humanly possible with priests helping them. When the Commandant's building, which had been turned into an infirmary, caught fire from an artillery shell, unimaginable scenes played out. Hundreds of soldiers were trampled in the rubble, died in the fire, were buried under the collapsing ruins. Typhus In the last days another insidious danger appeared which pursued the surviving soldiers of the 6th Army all the way to the prisoner of war camps and mowed down tens of thousands of people typhus. At first it was not noticed that some soldiers seemed extremely tired, fell into a stupor, they were chilled, their arms and legs ached, they were delirious in the heat and eventually died. There were diseases with the same symptoms, such as Volhynia fever. Typhus, however, was incomparably more dangerous. Its causative agent, carried by bed lice, caused death in 80% of cases within one to three weeks. More than 90% of the army was infected. 
After all, it was impossible to pick off the rapidly multiplying lice in frozen snow holes or dark cellars. Almost everyone who at the end of January or the beginning of February 1943 was taken prisoner carried the germ of the deadly infection. Only a very few had been inoculated to protect them. Only a very few could withstand the high temperature of more than 41 degrees Celsius that tormented them for days in a state of semi-starvation. Despite the dedicated work of Soviet doctors and nurses, death from typhus reaped a rich harvest in the POW camps. It continued the grim game of German militarism, with the Sixth Army leaving only a few thousand men alive. The blame for this fell on the same forces that had chased the Sixth Army down to the Volga and ordered it to hold out there in inhuman conditions until finally the men died. In a department store I was huddled in a basement with Paulus. In another cellar opposite us found Shelter Schmidt with his chief of operations. In two or three other rooms were located the rest of the staff of the army headquarters. It was probably a large department store, I thought as I walked around the building. There was a wide street-like passageway through the huge basement where trucks could enter from the courtyard. On either side were storage rooms with large windows. Now sandbags were piled in front of the windows. In the aisles stood our vehicles, protected from shrapnel and direct hits by thick walls and ceilings. The upper floors were destroyed. The whole house, down to the first floor, burned to the ground. By some miracle, the stone staircase that led to the attic survived. It seemed to hang loosely between the floors, but it was still possible to climb. From the height of the third floor, the large square was clearly visible. Opposite were the ruins of the theatre, and to the east, between the ruins, the ribbon of the Volga River glistened. To the right of the theatre could be seen Tsaritsa, a small tributary of the Volga with high, steep banks. The army headquarters was in the area of operations of the 71st Infantry Division. Colonel Roski, appointed after the death of General von Hartmann its commander, January 27th was promoted to general. The soldiers of the division were in much better condition than the soldiers in the western and southern portions of the cauldron. Since the beginning of the encirclement they had almost always had well-equipped positions and heated shelters and, surprisingly enough, apparently adequate food. Soon, skirting the cellar, I came upon a series of doors on which heavy padlocks were dangling. To the non-commissioned officer accompanying me I ordered him to open the doors. He reluctantly complied with my order. The reason became clear when the doors were opened, and I saw that quite a large quantity of food was hidden in the rooms. Evidently the intendants, as well as the commanders in charge of supplies, had given incorrect information about supplies in November. It was a piggish thing to do. If the other divisions of the northern and Stalingrad sections of the cauldron, even if only in isolated cases, did the same, it was easy to calculate how much food was withheld from the divisions that were fighting hard in the western and southern sections. Roski admitted that he had relied, without checking, on the data provided by the intendant officers. The generals demanded surrender. On January 26th, Soviet units advancing from the west joined on Mamayev Kurgan, with units of the 62nd Soviet Army advancing from the Volga Bank. The hill, because of which fierce battles were fought in the fall, was finally taken by the Red Army. Now the cauldron was split into two parts, with the northern part of the cauldron telephone communication was cut off. VIII and XI Army Corps were left to themselves. Soviet troops advancing from all sides from every hour more and more squeezed the dissected parts of the cauldron. Several generals who had been left without troops were in the former city jail building north of Tsaritsa, and among them were von Seedlitz, Pfeffer, Schlomer, Dibois, Liza, Edler von Daniels, and Colonels Steidel and Beaulieu. These senior officers were brought together by chance. From the beginning they had experienced the horrors of battle, the slow agony of the army and the death of their soldiers. They could no longer consider it justified to continue fighting. Conscience commanded them at least at the last minute to prevent the death of the surviving remnants of the army. On January 27th, General Schlomer called me by telephone. He wanted to speak to the Colonel General. 
I asked him to wait a minute while I called Paulus. The conversation was brief. Schlomer outlined the situation and the state of the troops, completely exhausted and unable to resist, and asked permission to surrender. The commander reminded him of his orders to resist to the last and hung up the phone. Half an hour later, Lieutenant General Schmidt entered the cellar where I was with Paulus. Worried, he reported a telephone conversation with Colonel Mauler, Chief of Staff of the XIV Tank Corps. Mr. Colonel General, he reported to Paulus, XIV Tank Corp intends to surrender. Muller says, as if the forces are running out and they have no more ammunition. I answered him that we are aware of the case, but the order continue resistance, surrender excluded is not cancelled. Still, I would recommend you, Mr. Colonel General, personally visit these generals and talk to them. Paulus agreed. The trip to the city prison under enemy artillery fire was a risky business, but it went safely. Returning, Paulus told me that all the officers who were there complained about Schmidt. On reasonable inquiries and representations, they received from him only sharp answers. They referred to the fact that their divisions are completely broken. The battle groups are already making contact with the Russians and capitulating on their own. No one knows what is being done on the neighbor's section. Many divisions have been attacked by the enemy from the flank and rear and destroyed. To end the unnecessary bloodshed, they asked to order the surrender of the entire army. What did you answer them, Mr. Colonel General? I asked. I once again reminded the generals of Hitler's order, important every day, every hour, which allow you to restrain large enemy forces, answered Paulus. Large enemy forces. Do you really believe, Mr. Colonel General, that the Soviets continue to keep in the city area all those armies that fought here at the end of November? Because the size of the cauldron has shrunk considerably. A part of the former troops is enough to deal us a fatal blow. The enemy is well aware of our situation. His method of fighting shows that the Russians do not want to sacrifice a single man in vain. Of course, it is most likely that they have withdrawn part of their forces. But it is a fact that there are still many troops here. Generals and colonels, however, are of a different opinion. Hitler is a criminal was another of the milder expressions. As I left the basement of the city prison, I heard someone say to me as they deceived us, so will the German people be deceived. Neither the newspapers nor the radio will report on the horrors we have endured for so many weeks. Goebbels will try to portray our death as a glorious feat. About all this Paulus knew, and yet he continued to obey. A new radiogram of the general command of land forces strengthened his intention to hold on and further. It said that if the cauldron will be cut, each of its parts will be subordinate to Hitler personally. On January 28th, the northern cauldron was in turn cut into two parts. The army reported in the evening to the high command roughly as follows. Deep breakthrough of the enemy along the railway line Gumrak Stalingrad cut the front of the army in the northern cauldron XI Army Corp and in the central cauldron VIII and II Army Corp and in the southern cauldron the rest of the units in the army headquarters. XIV Tank Corp and IV Corps were left without troops. The army is trying to form a new defensive front on the northern outskirts and western approaches. The army assumes that finally its resistance will be broken before February 1st. With the onset of darkness, I sat alone in our cellar. Paulus went to Schmidt's. The artillery fire during the day was so heavy that we could hardly go out into the courtyard. Even now, the rumble of battle could be heard everywhere. I lay down on the bunk. There, outside, the merciless struggle continued. Every hour demanded new victims. No one was counting them. For days now I had been unable to get specific casualty figures. The reports were two General 76th Infantry Division on January 27th, very heavy losses 44th Infantry Division, defeated completely 371st, 305th, 376th Infantry Divisions, exterminated 3rd Motorized Division still has weak groups, no communication with the 29th Motorized Division. How many soldiers were still alive? How many bayonets were still at our disposal? How many wounded and sick were in the cauldron? 
doctors with whom I met in the last days called the figure figure 40 to 50,000. Was there still ammunition? Is there still food available? Is aid being provided for the wounded and sick? The last questions, as a rule, had to be answered in the negative. January 29th. It was reported that Lieutenant General Schlomer and other generals received the parliamentarians and negotiated with them about surrender. Schmidt threatened a court-martial. At the same time, Colonel Steidel appeared in the department store. He wanted to speak personally with Colonel General Paulus. He took part in heavy retreat battles on the west bank of the Don, participated in the creation of new defences in the southern section of the Cauldron, and lost there in heavy defensive battles, 376th Infantry Division, almost all of his regiment. The soldiers respected him as a brave and fair commander. Paulus appreciated him for his reliability and honesty. As early as January 27th, Steidel in a conversation with the commander expressed the opinion that the responsibility to the soldiers and the German people requires an immediate cessation of resistance. Now he came to persuade Paulus to give the order to surrender. In doing so, he got first to Schmidt, who probably guessed what the matter was. Schmidt flatly refused to fulfil the colonel's request to facilitate his meeting with Paulus and demanded that he immediately return to his unit. Steidel was forced to leave the department store without achieving anything. In the last few days, Schmidt developed lively activity in another direction. Thus, he summoned to him Colonel von Beaulieu, commander of an infantry regiment of the 3rd Motorized Division. The colonel had spent a long time in the Soviet Union in the 20s, spoke Russian, knew the country and the people, and as he emphasized the Red Army. I myself often met Beaulieu after the invasion of Russia had begun. I was surprised to say hello to him when I saw him coming out from the chief of staff. Schmidt asked me to tell him about the Red Army Beaulieu told me. He was particularly interested in the question of what to expect from its soldiers and officers. I did not know that your chief of staff can be so kind. Repeatedly summoned to Schmidt and interpreter Lai Army Corps, seconded to the army headquarters, he was a white emigre, a former landowner and ensign in the Tsarist army. With him Schmidt also talked about the Soviet country and its people, about the soldiers and officers of the Red Army. What purpose did the chief of staff pursue with these conversations? Was he probing the ground for captivity? Was he playing a double game? Just now he gave Roska an order to organize a circular defense of the department store, and he himself was preparing to surrender as a prisoner? Late in the evening of January 29th, in the darkness of the basement, someone touched my sleeve. At first I thought it was one of the wounded who had sought refuge here in recent days. The beam of a pocket lantern illuminated the face of Schmidt's orderly. The general was now at Roski's and was discussing arrangements for the defence of the command post. The Oberifrotnant led me into Schmidt's living quarters, pointed to a small suitcase standing in the corner, and opened it. I leaned over and, amazed, looked at the soldier. The one said, grinning. To all his subordinates he orders hold on to the last man. Surrender is out of the question and he himself is ready to surrender. I thanked him for such an interesting message and returned to myself. So that's what this is all about. Schmidt believes that the requirement to fight to the last man does not apply to him. Paulus was outraged when I told him what had happened. I never thought it was possible, exclaimed Paulus. The man who is still spreading rumours about the shooting of prisoners prudently collects information about what treatment awaits him on the part of the Red Army. He himself expects to be taken prisoner, but says nothing to others about it. I never had any friendly feelings for Schmidt, but I thought he was consistent in his own way. It is only in the last few days that he has shown his true colours. His word doesn't match his deed. It's a pity you followed his advice, Colonel General. Now it is too late to talk about it, replied Paulus. The end is near. Maybe another chief of staff would have helped me to make a better decision. But it is better to leave it. Yes, the end was near. There was no longer a solid line of defence. There were only isolated strongholds defended by battle groups. 
One such stronghold was opposite the department store, in the direction of the Turitza River, which had already been forced by the Red Army. It was defended by Colonel Ludwig's battle group, to which the still surviving remnants of the 14th Panzer Division had been reduced as a reserve of the army. The battle group entrenched itself in the ruins of some store. The window openings of the first and second floors were barricaded with bricks and sandbags. That was where the front line now passed. The Gorky Theatre opposite was already occupied by the Red Army. Thus Colonel Ludwig held the last defensive line before the last main apartment. Soviet troops were already shelling the department store. To the west of us, only a few blocks away, stood tanks with red stars on their armour. Indeed, the end was approaching. We had to decide suicide or captivity. Until now Paulus was against suicide, now he began to hesitate. After much deliberation, he said with grief, No doubt Hitler expects me to commit suicide. What do you think of that, Adam? I was indignant. Up to now we have tried to discourage suicide in the army. And we've done the right thing. You too must share the fate of your soldiers. If there's a direct hit on our basement, we'll all die. However, I would consider it shameful and cowardly to commit suicide. It seemed as if my words freed Paulus from a heavy load. In fact, he held the same point of view as I did, but wanted on my arguments to double-check his conclusions. It was in his manner. Now the silent man spoke. He began to recount what he had experienced and seen in the Führer's headquarters. As deputy chief of the general staff of the land forces, Holder's deputy, Paulus had witnessed Hitler's fits of rage on several occasions. During his reports, Colonel General Golder most of the time did not have time to say in the first phrases, as Hitler, not holding back, interrupted him and spoke further himself. Paulus also said that the mad megalomania Hitler fed on the fact that those around him, especially General Keitel, sycophantically exalted him. As Hitler's role emerged clearly and mercilessly from these accounts, it became increasingly incomprehensible and even inexcusable that Paulus, who knew Hitler so intimately, continued to pay obeisance to him. This was once again sharply apparent when on January 30th, 1943, on the tenth anniversary of Hitler's assumption of power, Schmidt drafted two radiograms to Hitler, and Paulus signed them unchanged. The first one read, The Sixth Army, faithful to the oath of Germany, aware of its high and important task, to the last man, and to the last cartridge holds the position for the Führer and the Fatherland. Paulus. The second radiogram contained a greeting for January 30th. On the occasion of the anniversary of your assumption of power, the Sixth Army salutes its Führer. The flag with the swastika still flies over Stalingrad. Let our struggle be an example to present and future generations that one should not capitulate even in a hopeless situation, then Germany will win. Heil my Führer, Paulus, Colonel General. Was this not an outrage against the cruel fate of the Sixth Army? The Army Command could not have done Imperial Propaganda Minister Joseph Goebbels a greater favour. These radiograms provided an opportunity to extol the Army's unjustifiable demise. Hitler responded without delay. My Colonel General Paulus. Already now the entire German people are looking at this city in deep excitement. As always in world history, and this sacrifice will not be in vain. Clausewitz's commandment will be fulfilled. Only now is the German nation beginning to realise the gravity of this struggle and will make the gravest sacrifices. My thoughts are always with you and your soldiers. Your Adolf Hitler. The same false pathos permeated Goering's speech on the occasion of January 30th, 1943, which I quoted at the beginning of this book. Addressing the still living soldiers in the ring compressed to the limit and to their fear-stricken loved ones at home, he cynically exclaimed in the end, no matter how cruel it sounds, a soldier does not care where to fight and die, whether in Stalingrad, at Rajev, or in the deserts of Africa, or in the north, above the Arctic Circle, in Norway. When I heard the voice of a fat air marshal, 
I was seized with a feeling of nastiness and anger at the rabble around Hitler, who after his shameless betrayal, now forced us, still alive, to listen to the funeral service for themselves. Before evening furious Schmidt came to Paulus. I have just been informed, he said, that Colonel Ludwig is negotiating with the Russians. I summoned him for a report. My first thought was poor Ludwig, it will not be easy for you. When the chief of staff left, I expressed my fears, Colonel General. However, Paulus reassured me. I will not tolerate that Ludwig was punished because of his unauthorized actions. An officer in a steel helmet, with a machine gun, was sent after Ludwig. This was very similar to punishment, and also fully in line with the formula Schmidt had hitherto used whoever makes unauthorized contact with the enemy will be shot. As Ludwig later told me, he had expected the chief of staff to bring him to justice. However, it turned out differently. Schmidt first asked how secured the southern section of the boiler, for which Ludwig was responsible. Then he still asked him to sit down. Ludwig's expected question followed. Direct and cold, I have just heard that you negotiated with the Russians today, is it true? The colonel reported how and why it had come to negotiations. He justified his move by referring to the loss of combat capability of the troops and the presence of tens of thousands of wounded and sick deprived of help. Reporting, he all the time carefully watched Schmidt. However, he did not interrupt him a single word and only paced back and forth in his basement. A few minutes after Ludwig had finished, he suddenly stopped in front of him. You easily out of the blue communicating with the Russians, negotiating surrender, and we in the army headquarters remain on the sidelines. Ludwig did not understand at first. He was prepared for everything, but not for this. The general, who had stubbornly ordered to hold on, suddenly showed interest in surrender. Did he now want to save his life, after having distinguished himself for many weeks by his precise obedience to Hitler's and Manstein's orders, and thus contributing to the demise of the Sixth Army? If it is only that, Herr General Ludwig replied, I think I can promise you that tomorrow morning, at about nine o'clock, a parliamentarian will appear here in front of the cellar. Very well, Ludwig. Attend to that, and now good night. Colonel Ludwig had never been more puzzled in his life than by this remarkable conversation with Schmidt. And the latter, after his conversation with the colonel, came to Paulus, but did not say anything about the course of the conversation, but only reported that he had instructed Ludwig to mediate the surrender negotiations of the army headquarters. This fact completed the final touch in the image of Lieutenant General Schmidt. Even the day before he had threatened to be shot, now he was ready to surrender. His life was evidently too dear to him to have any desire to fight with rifle in hand. Of course, the contradiction in the behaviour of generals and senior staff officers, who demanded that the soldiers fight to the last bullet, and themselves surrendered without a fight, was characteristic not only of Schmidt. But with him it manifested itself especially sharply, because no one else was so fanatically and adamantly opposed to all rational thought as this evil spirit of the army. Thus he showed his failure not only as a military specialist, but also in purely human terms. After the Chief of Staff left, Major General Rosk appeared. He briefly reported to Paulus. Divisions are no longer able to resist. Russian tanks are approaching the department store. It's the end. Thank you, Rosky, for everything. Give my thanks to your officers and soldiers. Schmidt has already asked Ludwig to negotiate with the Red Army. I threw into the fire still remaining papers, as well as a dozen knights and German crosses. I had not yet decided to part with the seal and hid it together with the stamp pad in my briefcase. Then I went to my assistant Oberlutnant Schlesinger and to the clerks, oriented them to the situation and checked whether everything had been destroyed here. For an hour or more I sat then opposite the army commander in our cramped room. A candle flickered between us. Silence reigned. Each was occupied with his own thoughts. At last I spoke. Mr. Colonel General, you should sleep now. 
or you will not survive the next day. It will cost you the rest of your nerves. It was past midnight when Paulus stretched out on his mattress. I glanced over to Roska for a moment. What's new, I asked, entering. Rosk was busy destroying the last of the unnecessary things. He asked me to sit down, offered me a cigarette, and lit one himself. Quite close, in the alley, said Rosky, stands a red tank. Its gun is aimed at our ruins. I reported it to Schmidt. He said that we must at all costs to prevent the tank to open fire, as it would mean certain death for all of us. So the interpreter with the white flag must go to the tank commander and begin negotiations for surrender. I myself, he said, will take care of it. Hence, in a few hours it would be over. I slipped quietly into my bed. Paulus was breathing deeply and evenly. I could not sleep. In vain I tried to concentrate to curb my restless thoughts. I thought of Paulus, who slept in his bunk beside me. He had once been considered a capable general stabist, and he was predicted to have a great career. And that's where fate had led him. Fate? Did fate condemn him and his army of a quarter of a million men to death? To what extent were his personal qualities, his military and human weakness to blame for this doom? Should we not look much deeper for the cause of our misfortune? Should we not be led to our doom by events that began long before the Battle of the Volga? I recalled some of the remarks that Paulus sometimes made about his activities as Deputy Chief of General Staff of the Land Forces when he was directly involved in the development of the war plan against the Soviet Union. Was it not better not to start the Eastern Campaign and the whole war in general? What purpose from the military point of view can justify the streams of spilled blood, the mountains of ruins, the suffering? The war against Soviet Russia was necessary for preventive reasons, we were told, it was necessary to repel the threat of Bolshevism. As a matter of fact, I never fully believed this argument. What I personally witnessed on June 22, 1941, and in the weeks that followed, in no way confirmed that the Red Army was put on alert for a war of aggression, rather. One could conclude that it was not only not prepared for war, but was not even sufficiently prepared for defence. During my year and a half on the Eastern Front, I had the impression that in the former Tarist Russia, whose hopeless backwardness I had known from the First World War, there were now forces at work, striving to create something new and great, but still far from being able to cope with the difficulties. Was it not, in fact, logical to assume that the masters of the Kremlin would first work on mastering the gigantic possibilities of their vast country, instead of entertaining the dubious thought of attacking Germany? And what if this is true? If this war on our part serves no defensive purpose at all, if it was not necessary at all? Terrible. Then all this blood and all the filth of this war will fall upon us. Can we go on living with such a terrible burden? Would I ever get a clear answer to the question of the meaning of the death of our army? And was this war justified at all? It was a vicious circle. In that night hour I searched for a clear answer to the questions swarming in my mind, but I did not find an answer, and in front of me there were more and more questions, more and more ambiguities. It seemed that for four decades of my conscious life I had too seldom thought about what was happening, too many things seemed to me too clear and unproblematic, too many events I took on faith, not realising the true behind-the-scenes side of the phenomena. What, in fact, was my life? What was I living for? I remembered my parents' farmhouse in Eichen, near Hanau on Main, the pride but also the burden of my hard-working father and my, my mother, who had died too soon. She gave all her love and care to her two sons, my older brother and me. My parents did everything they could to make our childhood happy. They and their parents instilled in us the well-known principles and norms of life, my father had a strong attachment to his native land. He was a business-like peasant, valued and respected in the village. The word Germany always sounded solemn and proud in his mouth. This applied even more to my grandfather on my mother's side. For more than 25 years he led the community of Eichen as burgomaster. He was a member of the provincial Landtag in Kassel and adored the old Reich Chancellor Bismarck. 
Wilhelm von Bismarck as Landrathenau was for several years his immediate superior in the hierarchical line. In such an atmosphere my brother and I were brought up, we were instilled with a love of the fatherland and loyalty to the Kaiser. These were the principles we learned at home, at school, and later at the teacher's seminary. From them grew attitudes and ideals that greatly influenced my life. For example, from 1910 to 1913, I had a geography teacher who made hostile invectives against England in every lesson. He and some other teachers of the time did their best to make a very indiscreet appeal to Geibel. And on the German model, let the whole world be built. Took deep roots in us young people, made us the source of German arrogance, German nationalism and chauvinism. My grandfather's love for Germany, my father's love for Fatherland, my father's love for Germany, my father's love for me and most of the people of my generation was combined with a sense of German superiority, with the German claim to a leading role in the world, to conquer and protect which was our legal right, our sacred duty. Therefore we regarded the First World War as something natural. I found nothing wrong with it. Like tens of thousands of other Germans, I had enthusiastically gone on the campaign to, as we were assured, defend the throne and the altar. I returned home, angry and disappointed that Germany had lost the war. Resenting the injustice of fate, I tried to forget myself in my studies and teaching. Soon, however, my interest in the teaching profession disappeared. I taught at a school in Langens Elbold near Hanau on Main. In my memory, I could see the blonde, dark, or black heads of children. How my pupils' faces burned with eagerness when we were digging up a burial mound, founding a modest local history museum, or competing in sports or games. Now the oldest of my pupils of that time have long since worn military uniforms. Which of them were killed or wounded? I didn't know that. After all, after my appointment as a mathematics teacher at the Military Craft School in 1929 and my enlistment as a captain in the Wehrmacht in 1934, I had little contact with people from my former circle. Of the people I met in those years, I particularly remember the carpenter Redder. He was a communist, in fact, the only communist I knew at that time. Two of his sons attended school. My father willingly, expertly helped as a craftsman to fulfill our school plans. I established a good relationship with him. If he started talking about politics, I simply waved him off. It didn't interest me. He would often say to me, Hitler is war, and I would reply with an arrogant smile. When World War I ended in 1918, with the defeat of Germany, I was also disappointed that my officer career had failed. The desire to be an officer did not leave me during the Weimar Republic either. In 1934, in the second year of Hitler's rule, it was fulfilled. I had almost forgotten the communist Redder and was proud of the successes that Hitler had made continuously. He introduced universal conscription, created the Luftwaffe, the submarine fleet, occupied the Rhineland, regained the Saarland, carried out the Anschluss. Of Austria, occupied the Sudetenland, formed the Protectorate of Bohemia Moravia. Did not these successes confirm our right and our claim to leadership? And all this without war. Plus, he eliminated unemployment, built freeways. Still, Hitler is a brilliant Führer, I thought at the time. If my grandfather were alive, he too would exalt Hitler above Bismarck. Of course, not everything was to my liking the arrests of communists and some others. It was said that they were being isolated in camps. A human pity, I said to myself, thinking of Rieder. But why are they opposing a development that has undoubtedly made Germany stronger and more powerful? Kristallnacht and other persecutions of the Jews had a repulsive effect on me. But after all, I was not responsible for them. And besides, one must not forget the great successes that National Socialism had brought to the German people I tried to ease my conscience. True, there was a small thorn in my heart, but what did it mean in comparison with the happy goal of the deeds, which seemed endless? Then came September 1st, 1939, the war against Poland, 
I felt then that a new and more serious period had dawned in Hitler's policy. In this the communist Reda was right. However, the Polish campaign ended after only 18 days, a great victory had been won. France and England did not intervene. Six months after Poland, Denmark and Norway were occupied. Then France, considered the strongest military power on the continent, was crushed in six weeks. It was forced to surrender, the disgrace of Versailles was over. The British, as we said, learned to run at Dunkirk, they were thrown into the sea. Again a grand victory so far, the biggest in the Third Reich's extravagant rise. Unfortunately, from me and my wife he demanded a heavy sacrifice. On May 16, 1940, our son Heinz died. It was a terrible blow, and we were stung by the pain of loss. It was already much more than the nasty deeds of the Nazis. It was my own flesh and blood, my only son, my hope. My wife never recovered from that loss, and my heart bled when I thought of my dead son. But as a soldier I was always ready to make sacrifices I believed for Germany, for my fatherland. So I overcame myself, believing that this sacrifice was made for a great cause. The fanfare of victory sounded again, announcing successes in submarine warfare, in Africa and in the Balkans. Despite some minor setbacks, it seemed that the German chain of successes had lengthened by several more major links. And then came June 22, 1941. The German Wehrmacht, supported by the Romanian and Finnish armies, marched against the Soviet Union on a front of 2,000 kilometers. The world held its breath. I, who crossed the Soviet border with the XXIII Army Corps that day in the direction of Kovno, was somehow uncomfortable. It was a war on two fronts, which was always feared. And we ourselves got involved in a war on two fronts, attacking the enemy, about whom we did not know much. At first, however, everything went smoothly. The fanfare of victory rang out daily. The chain of happiness lengthened by several new full links. Then something happened that had never happened during the eight years of Hitler's domination next to the chain of happiness a chain of unhappiness appeared. And it began immediately with massive links formed by German defeats at Moscow and Leningrad, at Kalin in Oral, Kursk, Kharkov, Stalin and on the Kerch Peninsula in the winter of 1941 to 1942. However, these links did not look so big compared to those added by the defeats in the winter of 1942 to 1943 especially the loss of the Sixth Army. A monstrous fear gripped me. Who will stop this fatal development? What would happen to Germany if the war continued to approach the German borders at the same pace? How long will the other fronts be able to hold out? What if the destruction of the Sixth Army is the beginning of Germany's demise? These agonizing questions haunted me in confused visions of a restless dream. The Russians have come. January 31st, 1943, 7 o'clock in the morning. Slowly the dim dawn came. Paulus was still asleep. It took quite some time for me to get out of the maze of thoughts and nightmarish dreams that tormented me. Still, at least I had gotten some sleep. Just as I was about to get up quietly, there was a knock at the door. Paulus woke up. The chief of staff came in. He gave Colonel General a sheet of paper and said, I congratulate you on the production of field marshals. This is the last radiogram it came early in the morning. It must be an invitation to suicide. But I will not give them this pleasure, said Paulus, after reading the paper. Schmidt continued. At the same time I must report that the Russians have come. Having said this, Schmidt took a step back and opened the door. A Soviet general with an interpreter entered and declared us prisoners of war. I placed our pistols on the table in front of him. Prepare to leave, said the Soviet general. I will pick you up from here around nine o'clock. You will go in your own car. Then the general and the interpreter left the room. It's a good thing I still had my seal. I performed my last official duty I wrote in the soldier's book Paulus Production in the General Field Marshal, sealed it with a seal, which I immediately threw into the burning furnace.
Then I went to Roska I wanted to know about the events of the night. He informed me as follows. A few hours ago I already told you that Schmidt ordered the interpreter to go with a white flag to the Soviet tank commander. After you left I went upstairs with the interpreter. In front of the entrance to the courtyard stood the Soviet tank, meanwhile it had moved even closer. The entrance hatch was open and a young officer looked out of it. Our interpreter waved a white flag and approached the tank. I heard him speak to the Russian. Afterward he narrated to me that he said the following to the Soviet officer cease fire. I have extremely important business for you. A promotion and an order are assured for you. You can come with me and take the commander and the entire staff of the 6th Army prisoner. The Soviet officer radioed to his commander. Two more Russian officers and several soldiers appeared. They approached the entrance to the courtyard where I met them. We went to the basement through a side entrance which was next to Schmidt's room. It was still covered with sandbags, but Schmidt had ordered it to be opened. The negotiations were conducted at my place. I offered to involve the commander in them. But Schmidt rejected it. Obviously he wanted to document for the last time that in the army everything was done according to his will. The chief of staff entrusted me to negotiate. He himself intended to intervene only when it was, in his view, necessary. In the meantime, a Soviet general arrived with several officers. After a formal greeting, he informed me of the terms of surrender. In doing so, he did not answer any question or submission on my part. When I was about to agree, Schmidt, who had hitherto kept aloof, intervened in the conversation. He wanted to clarify a few obscure matters. You, Adam, would have been as stunned as I was to hear what Schmidt asked. He asked the Russians the following questions. First, can the field marshal retain a personal orderly? Second, can he take with him the foodstuffs belonging to him? Third, could not the field marshal be assigned a Red Army escort team for his personal protection during his journey to captivity? Frankly speaking, I was ashamed. In recent weeks I have often seen Paulus and talked with him. I cannot imagine that he would give Schmidt such an assignment. I have been always with him in the last few days, I remarked, and I know his thoughts. I, too, think it is impossible. If this sort of thing had occupied him at all, he would have told me, not the chief of staff. What did Schmidt want to achieve by these demands? Could it be that he is afraid of our own soldiers? After all, something about his stubborn behaviour has been leaked to the troops. It seems that his conscience is not clear. How did the Soviet general react to these questions? I had the impression that he was as stunned by them as I was. Instead of answering, he asked where, in fact, is Paulus. To this Schmidt replied, smiling. Field Marshal does not want to be dragged into negotiations. He wants to be treated as a private citizen. This was obvious nonsense such a formulation contradicted the demands just made with respect to Paulus. The Soviet general had a good impression of the German generals. I consider it a lowliness on the part of Schmidt, through which he may have wanted to achieve advantages for himself. Paulus never authorised Schmidt to seek special privileges for him. Major General Roske finished his message. At 5.45 a.m., the last radiogram was transmitted, there is a Russian at the door. Destroy everything a few minutes later, the radio station was smashed. Deeply discouraged, I returned to my cellar. On the way I decided not to say anything to Paulus. I wanted to spare him any unnecessary worry. He sat at the table quite indifferently. When the minute of departure came, he got up. Prepare everything for the departure of the headquarters, Adam. Tell them to prepare two cars and one truck. The large entrance to the basement was closed and guarded by a Red Army sentry. The officer on duty allowed me and the driver to enter the courtyard where the cars were parked. Amazed, I stopped. Soviet and German soldiers, who only a few hours ago were shooting at each other, were standing peacefully side by side in the courtyard, holding their weapons in their hands or on their belts but how strikingly different was their outward appearance. 
German soldiers ragged in thin overcoats over dilapidated uniforms, thin as skeletons, emaciated figures with sunken, unshaven faces. Red Army soldiers well fed, full of vigor in fine winter uniforms. I remembered the chains of happiness and unhappiness that had kept me awake last night. The appearance of the Red Army soldiers seemed symbolic to me, it was the appearance of a victor. I was deeply disturbed by another circumstance. Our soldiers were not beaten and even less shot. Soviet soldiers among the ruins of their city destroyed by the Germans pulled out of their pockets and offered the German soldiers these half-cadavers their piece of bread, cigarettes and fudge. At exactly nine o'clock the chief of staff of the Soviet 64th Army arrived to pick up the commander of the defeated German 6th Army and his staff. We got into the German automobiles standing ready. In the first car took places Paulus and Schmidt, the Soviet general sat next to the driver. In the second car I rode accompanied by a senior lieutenant of the Red Army. In the truck followed the rest of the officers and soldiers of the headquarters. The noise of the battle subsided. Southern Cauldron ceased to exist. Central Cauldron under the command of Gates, produced in one of the last days in the Colonel General, capitulated also on January 31st. 1943. Paulus still considered himself bound by Hitler's order and did not consider himself entitled to order the commanders of the other cauldrons to capitulate, since Hitler had subordinated them personally to himself, for the troops of the northern cauldron hell lasted for another two days. Despite the persistent representations of Generals Lachmann and von Lenski, the commander of the northern cauldron Colonel General Strecker did not agree to end resistance. On the morning of February 2nd, 1943, both generals themselves gave the order to surrender. The battle on the Volga River was over.